Uh, delighted to be here. This is a very good day for Kings, as you may have heard. Uh, we've just uh, managed to arrange a lease on the buildings across the road, the old BBC buildings, uh, which will now be part of the new Kings to match the expansion. I think much needed. Uh, and uh, having watched the performance yesterday, I think we'd also be delighted to take over the BBC Trust as well. Uh, we have an evening on politics. It's about 55, Ooh. 60 days to go before the election. Uh, and I'm delighted and grateful to, the, to Mori and the Media Standards Trust for coming along and opening this discussion, which will talk about how the election is being spun and who's setting the agenda. Uh, we're going to hear first from Martin Moore, who is uh, the uh, founding director of the Media Standards Trust. And he perhaps will say a word or two about what the trust does, but it is, the trust is now an integral part of King's, and we're delighted to, to have them here. And then um, from Bobby Duffy, who is the managing director of Ipsos Mori's Social Research Institute. And they will present uh, their findings, and then we have three excellent political commentators from uh, every part of the political spectrum. For, uh, Baroness Margaret McDonough, uh, member of the House of Lords, Labour peer, uh, and former General Secretary of the party, the Labour Party. Uh, John Rental, chief political correspondent at The Independent, and a long-standing follower and writer on British politics over 20 years. And Dan Hodges on, on my far left, uh, the political commentator at The Telegraph and the chair of the Ed Miliband Appreciation Society. Uh, you're all very welcome. Let me start with uh, Martin Moore. Martin, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the analysis that we're doing of the media coverage of this election campaign. But to set it in context, um, just under uh, 50 years ago, uh, in the lead up to the 1968 US presidential election between Richard Nixon and uh, uh, Herbert <coughs> Hubert, sorry, Hubert Humphrey, um, two young academics um, wanted to test a theory that they had. And it was not a theory, it was a theory about media influence. It was not a theory about the degree to which the media told people what to vote. It was a theory about the degree to which the media set the agenda um, for the election campaign and, and, and led and, and framed people's priorities for what they thought was important um, when deciding uh, who to vote for in the election campaign. And that study that they wrote, called the Chapel Hill Study, became a seminal study and it has been uh, done in many different contexts and in many different locations uh, and repeatedly uh, the findings are that yes indeed uh, the mainstream media does frame most of the issues um, that people then feel are important when making a decision as to who to vote for in the general election. Um, but in the last sort of 15 to 20 years we've seen this huge, huge changes happen of course to all of our media. Um, we've seen particularly uh, Facebook and Twitter start to become the mass media um, by which many people uh, find their news and learn their news. Um, at the same time, we've seen uh, massive shifts in the way political parties deal with elections, especially in terms of the scientific way in which they try to target voters and themselves frame the agenda for the media. And so what we wanted to do when we were thinking about this election, um, particularly given it's the first election where we knew the date and we knew it was coming, um, was to, to say, does the, does the 1968 Chapel Hill study still hold? Um, does mainstream media still frame the big issues for the election? Does it still dictate what people think about and what they base their decisions on? To what extent does social media play into this? And to what extent do, does the political agenda, particularly the party's agendas, um, uh, 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 shape the mainstream media agenda? Um, and so we're doing that... Um, uh, uh, so. So it's sort of, 
We're doing that uh, through looking at the four different layers, if you like. We're looking at the degree to which the political parties are trying to dictate the agenda. We're looking at the mainstream media and the way in which they're covering the election campaign and the issues they're focusing on. We'll be laying, layering onto that uh, some social media analysis from uh, the six weeks before the election itself. And then we're working with Ipsos Mori to compare the media agendas with public opinion, to understand the degree to which the media is actually reflecting or not reflecting uh, public opinion. Um, and we'll also be, um, uh, of course, looking at the degree to which the election is determined by unpredictable factors, by um, you know, the Gillian Duffy factor in 2010, and if we have similar uh, gates um, or gaps or whatever that, 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 that change and, and flex the agenda of this campaign. And we're doing that by um, uh, an analysis of all the national media outlets. So we're looking at all the um, online uh, national newspapers, plus the BBC, plus Channel 4 uh, and Sky, and including as well um, the Huffington Post and BuzzFeed. We're collecting and analyzing all the articles that are published, about over 30,000 articles a week, um, and then within that, the, the articles that are published about politics and about the election. And if I could just pick out a couple of early findings, and I should stress that we started this just two weeks ago, the third issue, we're doing it on a week, week, week by week basis. Um, and two weeks ago, we published our first analysis, and the second one last week, and we're publishing the third one this Thursday. And we'll continue to publish them on a weekly basis right up until the election. Um, but just to pick out a couple of very early findings, um, which are already um, uh, uh, seem to be indicative of where we're going. Um, both in the first week um, and in the second week, um, the economy has dominated uh, the coverage across the media. Um, it has been more than, uh, received more than uh, double the number of articles than any other issue um, that we've looked at. And of course, Partly that's, that's no doubt due to external factors. Um, two weeks ago there was still the fallout from HSBC and tax avoidance. Uh, and more recently there's been many articles around um, uh, the issue around tuition fees uh, and, uh, and indeed the, 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 the success of the economy according to the OECD and others. Um, but clearly I think it's difficult for us to disassociate that from um, uh, what we know is uh, certainly the Conservatives' main agenda during this campaign which is the long-term economic plan and to bring as many uh, of the questions around the issues in this election as possible back to the economy. And that's what we're finding in the analysis. We're finding that even when um, issues like the NHS and like education and welfare are raised, uh, they're being brought back to the economy, back to issues around debt and deficit and discussions uh, on that basis. And if you, what's particularly interesting to us at least is if you compare that to some of the, uh, uh, the polling that Ipsos Mori has been doing, the long-term polling and the short-term polling Ipsos Mori has been doing, um, then certainly at this, and I should stress, it's an early stage. At this early stage, the extent of the coverage of the economy seems to be out of sync um, with the, what the public think is the most important issue facing Britain today. Um, looking at this particular graph, the, the NHS has for, for you know, uh, certainly uh, two months, been the primary issue of importance for the public, um, uh, immigration the second, and the economy the third. Um, uh, but as I say, uh, what's been happening is all these issues are being yanked back to discussions around the economy. And if I could go back to this graph a second, the other thing that is particularly noticeable is that some of the issues that people we might have expected to dominate this campaign so far um, really aren't. So immigration... Um, so far has been covered uh, comparatively little. Um, and even last week, and we're just finding out this out now, uh, when, when there was uh, new news coming out about immigration and a, and a whole series of statements about immigration, uh, even then, even then, immigration just rises to about 350 articles compared to well over 1,200 for the economy. Um, one of the second findings, uh, we're looking at the coverage of each party. Um, and the extent to which the different parties are being covered. And it won't come as much as a surprise to see that the, 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 the parties that dominate coverage uh, are, of course, Labour and the Conservatives. Uh, more than twice as many um, articles about, uh, that refer to Labour and the Conservatives than all the other parties put together. But what was particularly, I thought, interesting when looking at this, if you, if you look at the data since the 5th of January, so really since, since, since campaigning began at the beginning of this year, if you look at it cumulatively, 
um, and you examine it as a proportion, um, then actually what's, what's, what's the most noteworthy is that um, uh, uh, the, the, the third and fourth place parties, if you like, the Lib Dems and the UKIP, um, if, you, if you go by their poll ratings, um, they are both, look, Lib Dems are being uh, significantly overrepresented in the press and UKIP significantly underrepresented. So going by the current polling with uh, UKIP at 15%, uh, UKIP is only getting about 7.5% uh, of coverage. So it's actually getting about half the coverage um, that you might expect based on its poll rating. Um, the third finding um, that I'll just bring out and uh, might, might be a, uh, a source of discussion is we've been going through all the various leader columns. Now, leader columns can be um, uh, uh, misleading sometimes because I don't think uh, many people think that leader columns direct people how to vote, but they are very good indication as, as to how newspapers, um, uh, uh, newspapers' views about the different parties and how newspapers are presenting their coverage. And certainly in the last, uh, the first three weeks that we've been doing the analysis, um, the coverage in leader columns of the different parties has been uh, far more negative than positive. Um, so there have been 61 negative statements about the parties in the leader columns compared to 25 statements, uh, sorry, 25 uh, positive statements. Um, if one compares it by party, there have been uh, 12 negative statements about the Conservatives across the press compared to 21 positive. If one looks at Labour, there have been 38 negative statements about Labour across uh, the press and zero positive. And I should stress that the Daily Mirror does not publish its leaders online, so the Mirror is not represented here, but across the rest of the national press, um, uh, there have been no positive comments in the last three weeks, leader columns about Labour. Um, so as I say, this is very, very uh, uh, early stage analysis, but certainly from what we're seeing so far, um, the, uh, uh, the coverage does not seem to be, it seems to be out of sync with uh, public opinion. It seems to be certainly at the moment um, uh, quite well coordinated with some of the priorities of the Conservative Party to keep it very, very focused on the economy. Um, and, uh, and that's coming out this week as well. And we'll see uh, whether that changes over the course of the next few weeks. But um, as I say, if you, uh, if, you, if you sign up, you will get a weekly analysis of the election um, at electionandspun.net. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Martin. And now Bobby Duffy will give the Ipsos Mori presentation. Great. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so I'm going to talk more about, obviously, public opinion, how the public decides uh, on the issues, uh, what's covered in the media, what the impact of social media is, etc. for them. So in some ways, it's important to start to say uh, that there's more to play for in many ways in terms of public opinion. Um, you can see that in very simple ways when you ask people whether they've decided whether to vote or not and look back at that over time. And you go back to March 1992, so one month before uh, the 1992 election, 81 percent of the public said that they'd already made up their minds and decided who they were going to vote for. If you come forward to April 2005, it was only 62% of the public that said they definitely decided one month out from uh, the election. By April 2010, uh, it was 54%, again, one month ahead of the election. Uh, this is a bit earlier, in, uh, ahead of this election, February, a uh, couple of months to go, but we're down to 48%. So it may go up a bit, but the general trend of people deciding uh, later on how they're going to vote is, is very clear to see. Um, and also, it's, there's some very big generational trends behind this. So very. Uh, understanding influence is going to get more and more important as uh, loyalty, party loyalty in particular, falls. And these are big forces pushing people away from that, that sense of party loyalty. So um, pre-war generation, when you ask them whether you're a supporter of one political party or not, just as a quick show of hands, have we got anyone pre-war, so anyone born pre-1945? It's always good to know your audience before I insult anyone. Anyone pre-1945? Yeah, so this, this is the generation that's most attached to political parties. So 60% of that generation say they're attached to one particular uh, political party. And that's been the, the same over this period from 1983 onwards. Baby boomers, anyone born 1945 to 1965? That sort of period. So we've got a few baby boomers in the room. So a, a lower level of engagement, around 40%, but still very high levels of engagement. Generation X, uh, that's uh, up to 1980, 1979. From 
1965 is quite a lot of those. And then Generation Y, we must have loads of Generation Y because I've not seen very many hands. <laughs> yeah, loads of Generation Y. So you can see the direction that we're going in. Uh, lower sense of uh, engagement with parties among the coming generations. So the older generation is dying out, being replaced with uh, other, gener other generations with much lower levels of attachment, and we're moving away from particular parties. So as that happens, understanding influence is getting more and more important. So what do people think influence is then? Um, I'm not going to talk so much about issues, as Martin's covered that a bit, but it's more about the types of things, the types of sources of information that people think is going to be important to them. So what will influence your vote? So we asked this, we just released this in the last uh, day or so, actually this morning in The Guardian, uh, and we're expecting the TV debates to play a big role um, in our decisions, if they happen, obviously. So 40% of people say that the leadership debates will influence how they're going to vote. That's twice as high as newspapers at 20%. Uh, election broadcasts um, come next, and then, but then we've got social media with 13%. But actually, that varies hugely among different groups of the population, and actually up to a third of 18 to 24-year-olds say that actually social media is going to be one of the key influences on their, uh, how they're going to vote in the end. Um, we, although people are less willing to say that they had, so that's what people think is going to influence them, but when you look back to 2010, we asked the same question. This wasn't before the election in 2010. This was after the election in 2010. What actually did influence your vote? And, and much lower, you can see the big shift, uh, much lower proportions of people saying what actually influenced them. I don't know particularly why that is. It's, people less, it's easier to admit something will influence you than has influenced you, or maybe you just didn't, ended up not changing your mind. But still, important to realize that a quarter of people in marginal constituencies said that the debates influenced their vote in the last uh, general election. So that's actually quite a big impact in those marginal constituencies. So important influences on people from different sources. I just want to pick up a bit on social media, uh, cover that a bit, because um, again, we've released some questions today, and people have quite a, a nice, balanced, nuanced view of the impact of social media when you look across uh, the public. So on the one hand, uh, quite a positive finding that it's giving a voice to people who would not normally take part in political debate. 71% of people agree with that. That goes up to 8 and 10 people who are actually using social media. Uh, uh, slightly fewer, half of people saying that it's breaking down barriers between voters and politicians and political parties. Uh, and we'll see some of the reasons for that in a second. Uh, but still, again, higher among young people and social users, more like 6 in 10 saying that it's breaking down barriers. But at the same time, they also agree with negative statements. They can see the downsides of social media. So whether it's making political debate more divisive than it used to be, so about the same sort of proportions agree with that, and making political debate more superficial than it used to be. So people can hold those two views, that it's actually opening up, but it's also having these uh, negative impacts <coughs> on the debate as well. And we're only really, uh, although we keep saying that this is going to be the social media election, we keep saying that at different elections, we're only really starting to understand this as a, as a source of influence. And we're doing work with Demos and CASM and the University of Sussex to try to unpick that uh, a bit more. And this is some results you may have seen that Demos re released themselves for the BBC uh, recently. And you can think of it in two different ways in which social media is a tool or important influence. It's a direct engagement tool, first of all, for politicians. So Demos has been doing work on actually identifying which politicians are online. Uh, this is Twitter in particular. Um, you can see that the dark colours are MPs, the lighter colours, sorry, the lighter colours are MPs for each of the parties, darker colours are the prospective parliamentary candidates. And you can see quite a high level of actual activity among MPs. So uh, there's no party, Conservatives actually come out a bit lower. It's about 74% of Conservative MPs have a Twitter account that they use at least a, a little <coughs> bit. Uh, but the rest of the parties, all the way up to 100% for the smaller parties. But are they actually engaging with people uh, through those? So we looked at about 60, or Demos looked at about 60,000 tweets over this uh, more or less a month period. And it was a real, real range of different levels of engagement. In fact, 89% of MPs replied to zero uh, tweets, so 20% of all MPs are just basically in broadcast mode when they're using social media. It's either uh, sending out stuff or <coughs> retweeting stuff. There are some admirable exceptions, a real range of people. So Tim Farron takes a particular prize here. He had 80, 876 tweets in this month, and 93% of them were replied. So if you're interested in the novel feeling of an MP replying to you, everyone uh, twit, tweet at uh, Tim Farron, um, and he was almost certainly going to get back to you, which is uh, uh, different sort of models that people are trying to use uh, on uh, social media. Uh, but 
The second use of social media is also obviously as a communications tool, information provision. And here you see that uh, mainstream media are still key to social media communications. So there's a, a key interaction between mainstream media and social media on this. So if you look at uh, all the tweets in the same reference period that Martin was using for the, the mainstream media, there's about 50,000 tweets that mentioned uh, David Cameron and about 33,000 tweets that mentioned Ed Miliband. Uh, but when you look at the sources of those tweets, the key top sources of those tweets, it does still tend to be dominated by mainstream media. So you, you have the I-100 uh, from an independent and I point of view, so a, a news <laughs> aggregator site, but then you have the Telegraph, then you have uh, Ed Miliband talking a lot about David Cameron as well from his account, as you can imagine, UK Labour, UK Chain, same sort of thing. David Cameron talking a lot about David Cameron uh, too, which is, which is good to see. And then it goes down and you've got other mainstream media in there too. From Ed Miliband's point of view, uh, you've got the Telegraph, very focused on uh, Ed Miliband. And it's just me, is it? Well, then you've got the Mail Online and then you have actually one of our panellists, uh, three in the list. So Dan is sandwiched nicely between the Mail and Boris Johnson and just above Piers Morgan, which is an interesting place for uh, Dan to be, a very nice place to be. Um, but you see, still throughout this, the mainstream media interaction with social media, there is no, the blurring of boundaries between these types of things, very difficult to disentangle uh, who's actually driving. But then there is the case that others do get attention. So the, actually the top tweet over this sort of reference period about David Cameron was actually this one from Phil BC. Uh, not actually related to a media outlet, but again, the interactions are very clear to see. This is a Times cartoon, and the hashtag is obviously BBC Question Time. So those, those interactions between mainstream and uh, social media are always interlinked. Uh, although there is a few exceptions to that, so this was actually the top tweet about Ed Miliband <laughs> over this period. <laughs> which was uh, the main reason it was the top tweet was uh, Bombay Bicycle Club retweeted it themselves uh, to their 760,000 followers. And uh, I'm not sure what's more shocking, the fact that Ed let a picture like this out or that Bombay Bicycle Club's got three quarters of a million followers. Too. Both of those things are quite depressing uh, to me, at least. Um, so that's what people see in some ways as influences on their views from the different sorts of sources. But we know that people are really bad uh, identifying influences on their views. Uh, and you can use analytical techniques to try to unpick that, so particularly regression modelling, to just see what is most associated with views rather than asking people directly, and that how that shifts over time. There's a, there's a really interesting case study, I think, on this, on immigration, actually, as, as an issue. We did this report back in 2005 about you are what you read, and we're updating it now for unbound philanthropy on immigration specifically. But in the 2005 report, um, what the key, one of the key findings from that report was that the top four factors to relate it to whether you think immigration is an issue or not was all what, what newspaper you read. So uh, the people that were most likely to see um, immigration as an important issue for Britain were all readers of different newspapers. So if, whether you read the Mail, the Express, or the Sun, they were the top predictors of seeing immigration as an issue uh, for the country, uh, controlling for other factors within the model about their demographics, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the other end of the spectrum, the group that was least likely to see immigration as an important issue for Britain were Guardian readers. Uh, so right at the other end of the spectrum. Again, controlling for differences in demographics, etc. Um, obviously, you can't do cause and effect in media, these types of media studies. It's, it's interlinked, goes both directions, all of those types of things, very difficult. But you can see it's not surprising that there's a strong association, at least, between those two findings. So this is our issues index, what's the most important issue, going back to 1996. So down in this bottom left-hand corner is 96 before anyone was worried about immigration. So the, it's not the case that mail and express readers have always been worried. Uh, they weren't worried at that point in time particularly, no different from anyone else at least. But then immigration numbers increase, and you see this massive, amazing spread of uh, views across different newspapers. So you've got the express at the top in dark blue, uh, Guardian at the bottom in gold, and Guardian are just as far from the average as the Express in terms of concern. So you've got this massive splaying out where uh, uh, newspaper readership is, is a great asso massive association with whether you're, you're concerned with that as an issue. But now, this is the new analysis which we've just done, be released in a couple of weeks, uh, a real shift in um, what is the most determining factor in whether you are thinking immigration is an issue. So now top is actually, not surprisingly, uh, whether you vote UKIP or not, by massive margin. So UKIP has become the focal point for concern about immigration. 
Uh, not a massive surprise, we've still got the mail, still got other factors in there. But then at the other end of the spectrum, it's actually whether you vote green is uh, the biggest determinant of whether you're least likely to see uh, uh, immigration as an important issue. So in some ways, there's something interesting here about how these dynamics shift over time, how public opinion interacts with media coverage, but over time, politics catches up in this case, particularly. Great, perfect. Um, so finally, for me, um, important to bear in mind in all of this that we're really pretty shaky on the facts, um, that we're susceptible to spin, as we're talking about today, but also the emotional responses. We don't deal in facts, we deal in emotions on lots of these issues. Uh, and you may have seen the perils of perception work that we did at the end of, towards the end of last year, but that kind of, that makes that point very clearly. So quick question for you. Uh, this is a question to be asked of the general public. We asked what proportion of the UK population do you think is Muslim? <laughs> Any guesses, just shout out, any guesses? Yeah. 5%. Oh, sorry, sorry. What, what percentage of the UK population is Muslim? You've already got the answer, don't you, Liz, I think. So 5%. Yes, that's right, 5%. But the average guess across Britain? 30% is not, well, not bad. 21%. We think one in five of the UK population is Muslim, when you ask on average. Uh, immigration, 13% uh, population uh, immigrants, anyone guess what the average guess is? 30, pretty close, we sometimes get 30, 24%. So we think one in four, uh, one in five, one in four, one in four of the population are immigrants. Yeah, <laughs> good, good with figures. Um, and then teenage pregnancies. What, what percentage of the population, teenage population, do we think gets pregnant each year? Teenage girls, obviously. What, 30? <laughs> 13. You think that's the guess, or you that's think that's the guess? That's the guess. What's the real? 0.3. Okay, it's actually 3%. 3% of teenage girls get pregnant each year, and the guess, 16%. Um, so whenever we do this, whenever we show this, whenever we do this, release this online, we always get the same sort of reaction from people, which is uh, that would be a Daily Mail effect. Um, it always comes up in discussions. That would be a Daily Mail effect. So that what we did with this study was ask it internationally. So we asked it in 13 other countries, and we're by far from, we're far from being the worst on these types of questions. Um, so you, actually, in the rank order, we come fifth from top in being most accurate. So if you look at some other countries, the French think that 31% of their population are uh, Muslims. Uh, the actual is only 8%. Italians think that 30% of their population are immigrants, when the actual is only 7%. And the Americans uh, think that 24% of their teenage <laughs> girls get pregnant each year. So one in four teenage girls in each class getting pregnant each year when the actual is only 3%. So finally for me, uh, in some ways it's not them, it's us in terms of people's reactions to this, how people are spun, how people are affected and influenced. We're not saying in any of this at all that people are stupid. There's, there's really uh, two broad schools of thought on this. So very contradictory in some ways but equally could be explanations of it. So from the US, you tend to get uh, this neoliberal focus among academics that people are rationally ignorant, that their vote doesn't affect anything, so why are people take the time and effort that it takes to be informed? So quite a, quite a rational view of why people are, are susceptible to spin, susceptible to emotion, uh, all of those types of things, because they're not informed because there's no incentive to be informed. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got all the social psychology explanations, where there's biases and heuristics that we're all subject to, where we remember vivid anecdotes, uh, not facts, we're not affected by facts, and we within that, we even emphasize negative information. We can show in experiments that people remember uh, negative information. So that, that has implications for how people campaign towards us. Uh, and related to that, is that misperceptions, those types of misperceptions that we see are something that social psychologists would call emotional enumeracy. So our worries cause our misperceptions as much as our misperceptions causing our worries. So we overestimate these things because we're worried about them. So finally from me, I guess it is not them, it is us, and we get the campaign we deserve in many ways. Thank you. <coughs> Bobby, thanks very much indeed, that's great. I have lots of questions, but we're, we'll come to those questions later. Can I say first of all that there are half a dozen seats, seven or eight seats here. If people standing at the back would like to sit down, they're very welcome to. We're now going to go to the panel and get a response, five minutes each or so, uh, from our three contributors, and I'll start with John.
And you can talk Thank about you. anything. You can talk about what you've heard or what you think about spinning the election. Thank you very much, Nick. I liked your, um, your, your introduction saying that the panel represents all uh, strands of uh, political opinion. I'm here to represent the Liberal Democrats and UKIP. Um, I, we've just heard, um, we've heard a, a couple of uh, theories of, uh, of the, uh, sort of the conspiracies against democracy. One is that the, the media control uh, what, we, what we know. Uh, another that is much more popular with my students, I have to say, is that the politicians and uh, parties and spin doctors uh, control what we what we know and what we what we learn uh, in in election campaigns and between election campaigns. Um, a lot of uh, my uh, classes uh, in in the Blair government have consisted uh, of me explaining uh, why. Uh, Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell were terrible at spin. Uh, they were very poor at media management, and the evidence I have for that is that they very quickly gained a reputation for spin. Um, if you have a reputation for uh, dishonest presentation of facts, then you are not doing a very good job at spin. What is remarkable about uh, the, the Labour government and uh, Tony Blair in particular, was how popular he was and the Labour government was for so long, even after it acquired a, a reputation for spin in about 2000, uh, which goes to the point that I actually want to, want to make, a very brief uh, point, which is that um, you can't put, uh, you, you can't sell a dud, a dud product uh, by spin and you can't actually make a good product unpopular by being bad at media management. Uh, I mean, New Labour was popular because it, wa it actually represented what people wanted uh, in, in government in this country for a very long time. Uh, I know quite a lot of you are a bit young and you may not remember that the time before Tony Blair was a war criminal uh, and <laughs> did all those terrible things, something to do with Kazakhstan. Uh, but actually bef before that, he was the most popular uh, Prime Minister this, this country has ever seen. He was actually elected and re-elected twice uh, for good reasons, which were to do with politics. Um, so my argument uh, against the idea that, that you know, we are, we are spun by uh, politicians or we are spun by media, shadowy media interests who are never defined, um, is that it's all a lot more complicated than that, as, as Bobby I think uh, began to show with some of those slides. Um, there is an interrelationship uh, between parties, uh, uh, the media and, and the public, and each one influences uh, the other. Uh, as Bobby said, the cause and effect is not clear. I mean, people read the Daily Mail because they are concerned about immigration, I suspect, uh, to a large extent. I don't think they are concerned about immigration purely because they just read. Uh, rubbish in the Daily Mail. I should declare a, an interest in this. We share an office in the House of Commons uh, at the Independent on Sunday. We share an office with the Daily Mail, which provides me with uh, daily education in how journalism works. Uh, and I welcome, uh, I welcome questions on that in a moment. I just wanted to, to share one other problem, which is, which is the problem of, new, of, of social media. Um, uh, I, I keep trying to tell people that Twitter actually isn't very important. Uh, for normal people. Twitter is how journalists talk to each other. Um, Facebook is, is, is much more important, but I don't understand how that works, except <laughs> I, uh, I recognize it is qu actually quite a good way of getting students to pay attention to what their reading list is next week. Um, but Twitter is very difficult to analyze. Um, and, you know, I mean, I know it's important because, because it influences journalists, or, or it, is, it is a medium through which journalists influence each other. And therefore, it is quite important to, to, to be able to analyze it. I spoke to a, a chap at uh, Oxford University who's analyzing Twitter uh, using algorithms, uh, basically a robot. Um, and he's, you know, th through linguistic computational analysis, he's able to analyze whether think people are saying nice or nasty things about David Cameron. And I said, well, what about sarcasm? And he said, well, we've got a robot sarcasm de detector. And I, <laughs> so I, said, I said, well, how accurate is that? And he said, well, 
humans only have about a 40% sarcasm successful <laughs> detector rate. Uh, so uh, the machine's about as, good as a, uh, about as good as a human, which just goes to prove that uh, irony doesn't work on Twitter. <laughs> John, thanks very much. Um, Margaret, you've, you've been on the other side of this. I have indeed. You don't uh, mind if I stand up, do you? Uh, whatever suits you. very much, Nick. I find it easier uh, to stand up. Um, tonight kind of takes me back a bit uh, to 1983, and I know from um, the earlier questioning of all of you, uh, many of you um, weren't around then. Um, but I was a general um, election agent in a marginal seat, and afterwards I blagged my way into an event like this, and I thought I'd arrived, I was really sophisticated. And an hour into this event, I thought, oh my God, I don't understand a word they're saying. And I couldn't help it anymore. You know, they were analyzing why Labour lost the uh, general election. And I jumped to my feet and said, but surely Labour lost because we didn't get enough votes. And so if, I, um, if, if you take anything uh, out from tonight, <laughs> is that you know the answer to the exam question that we've been set, which is who is setting the agenda. And I do intend to answer it in a very straightforward way. But first, I'd just like to take you through a couple of things about what's happening out in the world and the context that, uh, within which the agenda needs to be set. So we're going through a period of austerity. What happens during a period of austerity? Everyone retrenches. When we look globally, globalization is retrenching when you look at net flows. If you look at somewhere like Germany, um, ec 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 external equity investments, outflows from Germany has halved. When you go closer to home, when you look at Scotland, we can see the rise in nationalism. That's what, um, that's what happens on a national and international basis. What's happening in our communities? Uh, we're seeing huge changes. Jobs are becoming commoditized. Uh, we're seeing uh, not just phenomenons like children not doing as well as their parents or their grandparents, not just housing crises with oversupply in some parts of the country and uh, too much demand in uh, others. We're seeing social phenomenon for the first time. Uh, so, for example, um, Deregulation of the private rental sector in the 80s is now coming to fruition, particularly in uh, London and the South East, where we're getting a, a phenomenon of hundreds of thousands of children in short-term um, uh, tenured accommodation who are moving every six months, every 12 months. We have never seen that in our society before. On such a vast scale, children moving out of their primary schools into other primary schools, parents having to move their job. We don't even know the impact. So there's a whole range of insecurity. And what is the reaction uh, of the political parties? And if I can typify it by right and left, uh, the right, it's uh, a message of back to the future. Let's try what we've done in the past and do it again, even though we know um, that it hasn't worked. Um, and it, it is hope over experience. Let's do what we did in the 1930s. It didn't work then. Let's repeat it now. It's a bit like second marriages. Too many women marriage, marry a chap that is exactly like their first husband, which is why the second <laughs> marriage leads to failure as well. Um, and the left uh, um, are, can't move out of tactics into uh, having a strategic plan. Uh, they are much more comfortable with the growth agenda, and they are finding it difficult to find uh, their uh, voice in a world of austerity. So what is the answer to who is setting the agenda? The answer is no one. No one right now is setting the agenda. And you know that to be the case. And you will know when they begin to set it as well. Um, John Rental talked about Tony Blair. He was a man. Uh, who set the agenda. And I just want to leave you with one fact, and it's a thing to look out for when you see the opinion polls. In 2010, 12% of the population who voted did not vote for one of the major three parties. 12%. In 
If you looked in the uh, opinion polls today, 26% are saying that they're not going to vote for one of the main three parties. So it is more than twice. And the reason you're seeing that figure is that one of the main political parties are not setting the agenda. And I do believe it is leaders and political parties that do set it. Thank you. Margaret, thank you very much. Dan. Uh, thank you very much. I was, uh, just, I was fascinated by the first slide that came up there, which showed, I think, that the most, uh, the, the most widely reported news story the researchers found was the HSBC scandal, and I thought, well, they certainly haven't been, obviously haven't been researching the Telegraph much <laughs> over that. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, trust my others, not here. Um, anyway, I, 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 I've been privileged to do a number of these um, a number of these events, and, and they always seem to start off from what, what, what I believe is a misconception. And the misconception is that we are now living through um, what is perceived to be the decline of, the, of media influence over the political process, particularly the, the influence of the, of the print media. And, and the reason I say that I think that's a misconception is because I, I think in reality, I don't think there has actually been a time where the media and the print media have dominated the political process to the extent that is, is popularly perceived. If you go back and look through what I suppose people in the press would, 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 would look to, to as, the, as, as the golden age uh, of, uh, uh, of the modern media, others, those of us on the left who experienced it would have said the, 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 the demonic age, which is the period where we had what was perceived to be the domination of the Murdoch press over, over the political process, that period between sort of the late 70s and the early 90s. Whilst it's true there was a sort of a concerted political agenda by, by the media at that point, and the Murdoch press in, 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 in particular, it also did coincide with a period in which one of the main parties in British politics made itself completely unelectable uh, through the strategic choices it, it, it had taken. And that once it, it sort of came to its senses and that political party started to take different strategic <coughs> choices, then its political fortunes changed and the media coverage it received changed. And when the Sun finally backed uh, Labour in 97, although obviously it, it, it was very specific and said it, had, it was backing Blair, not, not backing, backing the Labour Party, it wasn't doing it because it felt at all that it wanted its influence uh, to assist the Labour Party and Tony Blair secure office. It did it because it knew full well Tony Blair was going to secure office like whether they liked it or not. And I think that's some, something we, we, we sometimes forget in, in, in this debate. I think another thing that we, that, that we need, to, need to think about is when we're talking about spinning the election and setting the agenda, particularly the setting the agenda point, I think we have to, we have to distinguish between whose agenda it is we're actually setting. Um, I, I've been privileged to work, on, 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 as it were, on both sides of the political fence as a spinner and now as a, as a commentator. And the reality is, in my view, people like myself and John, our influence, to the extent we have influence, is not that we write, we will write something and the great mass of the British public will think, oh, Dan's just written this, John's just written this, this is what I've got to think. Uh, and, and, and thank God for that. Where we do have some influence, however, is within, if you like, what we would call the, 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 the Westminster Beltway. Because if there is one thing that politicians uh, are obsessed about, it's, uh, it, it's about reading about politicians or not reading about politicians. And so if we are going to discuss influence, I think that's probably the one area where we do have, ha have a little bit of influence. Which brings us on to another point, which, which I think we need to understand, which is media influence over the political pr process within the lifetime of, uh, uh, of a five-year electoral cycle is, 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 not, is not a constant. We, are, we have, if you like, a sort of a half-life and, and, and indeed a shelf life. And I, I, mean, I, I was aware of the, 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 the presentation which said the next election is you know, it's still very much up to grabs and there are these huge swathe of people who are, who are waiting to make up their minds up. I, with, with respect, I don't actually believe that. I think the result of the next election is already determined. I think 
people's perceptions of the party leaders, of the parties, of the policies are, are now baked in, and they were baked in, have been baked in over the, over the period of the electoral cycle. And what we are about to see over the, over the next few weeks is that, that sort of that their, their perceptions being brought to the fore and eventually being sort of evidenced at, at, at the ballot box. So in that sense, the influence the media have changes over over the course of over the course of the parliament and, and our influence i think is greatest at the beginning of the parliament where perceptions are still are, are still there to be shaped i think another interesting thing was the point about how the the, the nature of broadcast media um has has changed and the perception that it, that it has changed and it, it and obviously it has in in myriad ways that we're all aware of in terms of outlets etc but I think there are two fundamentals which actually have been a constant, certainly through my time working in, in, in politics, and that is it is still the print media that sets the broadcast media's agenda. That is particularly true since the whole, um, the whole post-dodgy dossier for Argo, in which the BBC actively said after that, we don't make the news, we simply report the news. So we are still within the print media to an extent agenda setters in that sense. That is offset by the fact, though, that the public perception is that we do, within the print media, have an agenda, and that the broadcast media don't. Um, I, I, I think that is, I, I would question that, given the, 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 the debate we've been having over the, over the debates over the last, uh, last week or so. But nonetheless, it's still, the, it's still a case that the public perception and trust in the broadcast media is greatest than, us in, than those of us in print, and that of itself, obviously has an influence on, on, on how they perceive our influence. And I think the final sort of interesting thing, which obviously all of the contributors have touched on, is the issue of how the new media will influence the next election. And uh, it's something I'm constantly asked, is will this be the first new media election? And my answer, I'll give you the same answer I give them, is no, I actually think this will be the last new media election. I think this is the last election we will see where people, uh, where people predict and debate the extent that hashtags and Facebook and Twitter have on the electorate. I think we're going to find out that, though that, that media is very useful and is very enjoyable for those of us that live and operate within the political cycle, in the broader, out there in the, in, in the real world, if you like that, out there among the, amongst the electorate, this has negligible, if any, influence at all. And the final thing I would say, which comes back to the, the, the actual question that we're discussing, which is who is setting the agenda in the UK general election 2015, I actually think it's, it's the British people, because Whenever you, if you have ever attended a discussion at editorial level within a paper about the, the, the nature of the political support that, that that paper may be lending, there are basically two factors that dominate all others. One is if we give our support or endorsement for a particular party, what will the readers think? And the second is if we give our support or endorsement for a political party, will it have any influence on the electorate. So in the final analysis, as I say, the answer to the question is it's the British people who are setting the agenda in my view, and obviously I, I, I think that's the way it should be. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, we have, uh, what, half an hour or so for questions. I'll throw it open in a minute, but let me, let me ask two questions, first of all. To, um, to Martin and Bobby, but anybody else is, is very welcome to answer. First of all, um, given what you said about the weight of support, particularly in leader columns, opinion columns, for one party against the, the other, uh, the main parties, and the weight of criticism being generally hostile to Labour, isn't it uh, surprising well, perhaps it isn't. Is it surprising that the opinion polls have not changed more? Or does this show that uh, these papers really have no influence and they're putting out their um, editorials in line with their owner's opinion? 
but not actually changing much. And then the second question is, is a different question, is on Scotland, which I personally think is the most interesting and unfinished part of this election, uh, which could have a very big effect on the whole country. And I wonder if you have any evidence of whether the media there uh, is shifting opinion uh, one way or the other at the moment uh, in a way that could really affect the result. Uh, to, to your first question, I mean, I started out by talking about the Chapel Hill study and what, and what, what they found and what, and what has been emphasized repeatedly since, exactly what Dan was saying, is, is, is that in general, it's not that the media uh, determine what people think, uh, but they help to determine what people think about. Um, so in other words, it's the, it's the, the framing, the, the issues that are prioritized and covered and those that are not covered um, and that, that's what tends to have an impact, not necessarily on people's views, but about what people are thinking, what issues people are considering, and, and what they're making judgments on. And I mentioned, for me at least, one of the most interesting findings about the issues that are, that are being covered and not covered is the issues that are not being covered as much as I expected, and the parties that are not being covered as much as I expected. So just thinking back to last year at the European elections, the um, UKIP was, 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 was covered enormously um, throughout, throughout uh, mainstream media. Now, as I mentioned, it's, being, it, it, it's, it's garnering about s between 7 and 8% of coverage across, across the press um, compared to its 15% average poll rating. Um, so it's getting about half of what you might expect if, if it was representative. And, and, and I think that is much more likely. The fact that it's not, it, the parties and the issues are not being prioritized will have far more impact um, than actually the leaders and the opinions and the editorials. But they're still getting 15% in the polls. They're still getting 15%, but it has been dropping. Slightly disagree. Come on. Sorry, I was just saying I kind of slightly um, disagree. I think the media is most powerful when, when it chimes with the electorate or public opinion in general. Uh, if it um, starts to state things that their readership doesn't inherently uh, believe, uh, it... Um, it, uh, it, it doesn't work. The reason that UKIP's um, support is on the decline, I believe, has got nothing to do with whether the media are covering it more or less. I don't think that's where their support comes from. I think their support is inherent in people's views. If you go out and talk to the public, and I have to say I knock on doors, a um, bit old-fashioned, uh, I knock on doors at least once a week and uh, talk to the public. A bit strange, you know, somebody knocking on doors and ha having a conversation with you. Um, but the, uh, the reality of it, as voters get towards election, whilst they may be able to use a vote in a European election, election where they don't think it's a direct consequence, nothing will really happen if they vote for UKIP. When you start getting to the general election, even where people say they're going to vote UKIP, and you start talking to them, after a while they begin to say, you know, I know they're a bit extreme, uh, I know they have some unpleasant views, I know blah, blah, blah. So you're seeing the reduction in the UKIP support um, um, for other reasons than whether or not it's being reported in the media. Scotland or anywhere? Yeah, um, so I, I think the, obvi the obvious danger with all these sorts of debates is it, it does tend to go into some sense of absol absolutism. There's, there's, it's either got to be one cause or effect and the cause and effect has got to go in uh, one direction. And the trouble is it's a system that goes back and forward um, and that is the way it works. So, so from uh, a, even from a, a media impact point of view, there's been lots of work since the agenda setting uh, theory that's, that shows, that does demonstrate that there's other concepts that are really important to understand in this. So one of them is consonants, so quite like as, as Margaret was saying, actually people are looking for consistency in the messages that they see in the media. When, when it's a consistent uh, message that's coming across from so all sorts of different outlets, then people take more notice of that. When there's dissonance in the media coverage, then people take less notice and it's, they go on other things. And then uh, a second concept that's very useful is dependency, which is what Margaret was talking about. So dependency is that it has to chime with other aspects of their life. It can't be just judged in isolation. So um, the, the negative, whether negative views, negative coverage affects uh, how that translates into how people actually feel about an issue or how they behave around an issue has to have some link to other aspects of life that's outside the media. That, that seems, it's obvious that it's a, a system. So it's not uh, surprising at all that there is some elements that don't chime completely with the media, what the media is saying, but that chimes with how people behave. 
Um, and, and we just have to accept that, that it's, uh, it's complex in that sense. Um, and then on Scotland, Scotland's really interesting. I agree, uh, Nick, there's one of the most fascinating areas. In terms of media impact up there, it's, uh, again, similar sorts of issues to unpick. One of the, the key things is that it's, it's so much more divisive um, in terms of which side, side you're on. So there's so much more raging debates about the neutrality of uh, presentation of these things. And, and that, again, is a really interesting case study of how media and social media interact on that. And particularly, social media prominence of nationalists in, in Scotland does give a very different picture of public opinion to what we were measuring in the polls. And, and that sort of, that mismatch between uh, media, social media, and public opinion in Scotland is going to be a really interesting running up to um, the, the next election too, and something that we're uh, trying to measure and unpick a bit as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, 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 I mean, obviously it's mostly covered. I mean, the, the one thing I would just, I would just add to this, the, 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 if you like, the myth of, 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 of the influence and the, and the cause of effect thing. I mean, I think one, I can't remember who it was, somebody said at the beginning, we, we would be looking at this election to see if we have a Mrs. Duffy, um, a Mrs. Duffy moment. And what, what, what people, f forget is for all the, 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 the media hoo-ha over, over Mrs. Mrs. Duffy and that, that incident with Gordon Brown. Um, which constituency was it? It was, it was, Rock, was, it, it was Rochdale. That constituency was actually one of the few constituencies in that general election which the Labour Party actually won. So for all the excitement and, you know, you know such an... She voted such, Labour. Yeah, she, she voted Labour, but, but she was supposed to be you know, this iconic sort of symbol of, of, of people turning away, and obviously all the media sort of hoo-ha around it. But in fact, it, in, in that particular area, it wasn't something that it wasn't something that resonated. No, no, let's hear from the audience. Let's get uh, some questions, gentlemen. Then I'll take two or three at a time, and then just open it. To the Please say who you are and any affiliation if you want. To. Yeah. Um, Ivor Gaby, University of Sussex. I'm doing some work with Kersam and Demos on this project. Actually, as a PS to Dan, Mrs. Duffy, of course, recently came out and said she's a great fan of Ed Miliband, which does overthrow all those sort of stereotypes of Mrs. Duffy. Um, question to... Are there any stereotypes I've got <laughs> Question to Mr. Duffy. Um, all the academic and the BBC and the Ofcom research shows that broadcast news is identified as the most trusted and the most used source of news still, yet you neglected it entirely for your analysis. You had election broadcasts and you had leaders' debates. Um, and as a quick supplementary um, to Martin, it, uh, Margaret um, dismissed the relationship between UKIP going down and media coverage going down. I wonder which way the association goes according to your research if you tracked the polling rating and the media coverage. Gentleman over there. Female questioner. Hi, uh, my name's Jake. Uh, it's just a question for Margaret on the idea that uh, the, the print media and the social media reflect their readers' opinions. Uh, so that as people, as we're going to an age of online media increasing its importance and people are looking at attention, attention grabbing, attention grabbing headlines where people uh, the incentive of the media is to, for people to click through quickly. Uh, is there a move towards more extreme headlines to get those clicks? And if so, are the papers do further dividing and uh, providing more divisive influence on people, which may influence the idea of globally um, we have less, that people have less an idea of the actual statistics, opinions of different statistics. Is that trend which is actually happening or is this always existed? Take one more. Lady at the end there. Hello, uh, my name is Andrada Dobre. I'm a master's student here at King's. Um, I have a real problem with the statement that this might be the last new media election. Um, political apathy was a huge problem in 2010 amongst 18 to 25 year olds and it still is now. And considering the fact that we spend most of our lives online, on Facebook and Twitter, 
Um, and considering also that everyone younger than, than us that is turning 18 this year and will be able to vote in future elections spent even more time online than us, why should this be the last new media election when it would probably be the only way to engage with these voters who do represent the future of the country and not people that are 50, 60, 70 years old from now on? <laughs> That's us shot down in flames. Who's, who's going to start? Dan? Uh, yeah, obviously a couple of points. Um, the, the reason why I said it with the last uh, social media election is, 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 is simply I just think social media is the dog that's not going to bark in this election campaign. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I you know, watched with fascination and bewilderment the... <coughs> what was it, the let's kick Cameron out or, or let's get him out or whatever, hashtag, and the big row about why the BBC were, weren't reporting it and, you know, why, why they hadn't covered it. And the reason they hadn't covered it is because, in my view, it's going to have absolutely no influence. But, I mean, obviously, we'll have to wait and see, wait till the outcome of the election, and, and, and that's, that's, that's my viewpoint. I, I mean, the question from the, the gentleman who was asking about headlines, I mean, it's quite interesting. When I started fairly soon after I... I started writing for the Telegraph. I'd written, bizarrely, it was one of the few articles I'd written that, that, that wasn't actually focused on how rubbish Ed Miliband was. But it did still, but somehow I looked online and it had, still had for some reason, had Ed Miliband in the headline. And I said, why, why is that? And they, I was told it's, it's to do with search engine, and I can't even say it, never mind, understand it. It's to do with search engine optimization which is what, you know, what, should, what attracts people to the site. And, and we can sit here and say, oh, that's a terrible, sinister, um, you know, sort of new sort of thing within the world of media. But if you think about it, you know, not so long ago, the way newspapers attracted people to their, to their product was to, was to splash headlines like Gotcha and Freddie Starr and My Hamster on their front pages. So maybe we're actually becoming a little bit more sophisticated as a result of these... Um, as a result of these things. And the final thing, I can't remember the question was, but uh, I mean, to come back to the UKIP issue, I mean, one of the things, obviously, it, that, that we haven't, didn't really sort of dig down on in, 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 the, in, the, in the slides is obviously we're talking a lot about, about volume of, 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 of media coverage, and we're, not, we're, we're talking slightly less about the nature of the media coverage. You know, what it, you know, there is no such thing as bad publicity is one of the greatest myths in... Um, in the media, and I think it, in UKIP, as as Margaret said, what we are actually seeing is, is the is, you know, the chickens coming home to to roost for UKIP. I mean, the contamination of the UKIP brand um, as a result of the, the various, you know, you know, bonkers statements that, that that they and their supporters and spokesmen have come out with, and I think that that's what's that's what's damaging them. Uh, just on your point on search engine optimization, does that mean that if Ed Miliband were, God forbid, to lose, the Daily Telegraph would be disadvantaged and, and no, your no, column no, no, would no, no, not no. be read? Uh, well, who knows? We'll have to, well, we'll have to wait and see because I think that may be what's about to happen. But anyway, no, no, what I, what it, it's not, what, what I mean is it is simply that, that, that by focusing on Ed Miliband, I mean, he may not be a household name, but he's someone who, someone who people who read read blogs, the read, mm. read, read newspapers would be attracted to if we put him in his name in the headline, or the Labour Party in, in the headline. That attracts people. That attracts people to, the, to people to the site. Um, so that's why, you know, someone will say to me, "You've written ten articles about Ed Miliband in the in the last, you know, day or whatever." And I'll say no, I haven't. And then I'll find out actually I've had like Ed Miliband's, you know, one mention of him somewhere. But, 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 but that's be then perceived to be an article about Ed Miliband. So. I, I think you need him. Who's down? Well, I mean, just just one thing on the, on the on the research side. One thing that we're quite excited about. I mean, in, in, in on the research side is this is the first time that we have been able because of because of uh, uh, digital media and because of the tool tools that we've built in order to analyze digital media, we can um, uh, pr pretty much um, contemporaneously look at um, the coverage across the media and analyze it. And that's why we're working with Ipsos Mori, because then we can um, compare the degree to which the media is covering different subjects and different personalities and, um, uh, and different parties. 
Uh, and, and absolutely, as, as, as Bobby says, there's, it cl it's clearly a complex issue and it's, there's no direct cause and effect. But if we can start to see um, interesting interrelationships between the degree to which issues are covered and the degree to which parties are covered and the degree to which uh, opinions change, um, that will in itself be fascinating. And of course we'll have to dig into it. And of course we'll have to, ab absolutely, we'll have to look at the, the, the content as well as the quantity, et cetera. Um, but it's, but, it, but this, is, this is quite an unusual time because of, because of our ability to analyze digital media as opposed to print media. Um, uh, so so yeah, we're taking the opportunity to do that. So. Yeah, so uh, just on Arjun's point, uh, I suppose on it, it, it was more an issue of time. We did, we did look at the influence of broadcast news and we, we've asked lots of questions around that ourselves too. And it is a key influence. So if you ask people, for example, on the immigration issue, what's the biggest influence on their views, it will be broadcast news and documentaries that people will say. The interesting thing in the analysis is it never comes out, obviously, because it's not a distinguishing factor between them. It, it tends to be not a position uh, that distinguishes different views, because it ten tends to be uh, more neutral on, on that sense. And, it, and it's also true uh, that there's more trust. So there's a, a huge gradation within different forms of media in terms of levels of trust. So the, the overall question on that we always show of politicians and journalists bumping along the bottom of the lowest levels of trust in humanity. Uh, um, it, it's always been like that since the 80s. It, it hides a huge range of le different levels of trust from broadcast down to um, broadsheet, all the way through different types of journalists. But there's still a, a diff big difference between trust and influence. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work that shows that levels of trust is not that direct a, a causal factor in levels of influence because of the agenda setting, consonants, all the dependency type <laughs> arguments that we've uh, made before. So you can't too much focus in some ways on trust because it, it's more about what is being discussed and what is setting uh, that agenda in, in many ways for people. Uh, and just on the new media election, just quickly, um, uh, yeah, I kind of agree that we, we have to be really careful to dismiss it because, um, again, we're looking at it in very narrow terms. Is, is new media going to uh, affect the outcome of this election? Um, maybe not, probably not, as, as Dan says. There's not going to be a massive groundswell on Twitter or, or other social, uh, social media platforms that's going to change that. But looking at those trends of, first of all, disengagement with party politics across the generations, uh, that, that attachment to different parties being so generationally driven, and then looking at the technological connection that people are making being equally so uh, driven, um, then I think it's really short-sighted to say that there's not something there that could help re-engage young people with politics. And that, that, that may be thinking beyond how the current system works, where it's trying to affect one election outcome, and more about how you engage young people uh, and coming generations, which are, won't be young people in the future, will just be uh, the population, in actually shaping politics in more interesting and uh, uh, innovative ways that's not just about affecting an election outcome. So I think it's it very narrow to just say, because it's not affecting this election result, that means it's not nothing to do with uh, um, a political issue. It's a massive political issue, and how you can use those tools to re-engage whole generations of people that are going to be the majority of the population soon. John? Um, well, I would, I would just say that social media and conventional media are, are, are not separate things, actually. They're, they're, they're really um, in, deeply in, interconnected. I mean, people, people uh, through Twitter watch things on, uh, on uh, online video and, and, and TV programs. And you know, increasingly, you don't, watch, you don't watch live TV. But I mean, it is still certainly the case, as Iva said, that you know, th still, you know, th th this is going to be a television election be fought on television that is how most people get their their news and their and, and their information uh, and if you want evidence of that um, you just look at the debates about the TV debates I mean because the reason David Cameron doesn't want to take part in the TV debates is because the medium does actually matter um, the TV debates are a format that that disadvantages the incumbent uh, and he recognizes that and that's why he is determined uh, not to take part in them uh, and that does actually matter. It will make it will make a difference. Um, whether it'll make enough difference to uh, to help David Cameron stay as prime minister, uh, I don't know. Margaret, thanks, uh, Nick. I completely uh, agree with John that social media and um, print or broadcast media 
is, are not different entities. They are distribution channels. What matters is the content. Uh, if you look at, for example, Twitter, uh, probably, I would say, 85, 90% of tweeted political stories are political stories that first appeared in newspapers or on television, principally um, in newspapers. So there is a symbiotic uh, relationship. Um, I think people really um, overemphasize these debates. Where they've been going longer in the States, they really have no impact on the outcome of the election. If you look at the presidential debates over the last you know, 60 years or so, I think probably in uh, the Kennedy-Nixon uh, one was that uh, is, is, is the standout one that made uh, a difference. James, I'm hoping I'm getting your question right in uh, answering it, and if not, um, I understand uh, there might be, you know, if, uh, come up and have a chat afterwards. But, you know, the news, will the newspapers be extreme in this election? Absolutely, they will be, and it will be back to the 80s. And there's three reasons. One, um, newspapers find, are finding it very difficult financially right now. Uh, and when that happens, it causes extreme behaviour. People want to uh, attract uh, readers. They're, they're in, most of them are in real financial um, trouble. The second thing is, who is in the chair? Who is the editor at the time of the election? Uh, and when we look across uh, the editors, they pr you, know, you, you either have these kind of quite thoughtful editors or kind of gung-ho editors. And I think right now we're probably slightly more of the gung-ho um, emphasis uh, right now. If you look, for example, if anybody here did their uh, thesis on the Times and looked at the current editor and the previous editor, you know, in, in, in the last 18 months, you would think that you were reading two different pa pa papers. And the last reason I think there'll be more extreme is the quality uh, and where the left to centre party is. If um, the written uh, print media think there is any perceived weakness uh, in the left of centre party, which in this case is Labour, could also be the Greens, um, they will uh, go after them. And there is a different test, and that's fine, you know, let's all live in the real world, we're all consenting adults here. There is a different test to them uh, than Conservative politicians, and we can see that right now in Home Secretaries. You know, a Labour Home Secretary would have gone if all of the things that happened to the current Home Secretary around e-borders, around, you know, not getting foreign prisoners when they're released out, and all, all, all of those sorts of things. So there's a different test, and I think that test will be harder. So I think this election will be very screechy, if I can put it that way. Um, the last thing about young people, what is more important than social media in this election is the changes to electoral registration. And if you do anything in terms of civic duty, I would ask everyone here to take this issue up. In this country, we have always had household registration, where somebody in the house, normally mum, mum, but not always, would register the entire family. When students go to college, it would be the college, King's College we are tonight, would register all their students. Um, that has been changed for no good reason. There has never been a, pros a prosecution for somebody falsely registering in the entire history of Britain. And now we have lost a million people overnight to the register, a million people. These are principally young people and frequently black. And not only have they done that, they've taken off the age you need to register, because you shouldn't register when you're 18, you should register from the age of 16 uh, years and three months. I think it is completely and utterly criminal. Uh, when, um, after the general election, I can say this, because I don't have to seek re-election. I might have worked on elections, but I'm sensible uh, about getting into the right uh, side of the house. Uh, I want to bring in a, a bill uh, on automatic registration in this country for everybody. Thank you. I think we've time for just two more questions and, and quick answers. So, uh, gentleman here first, and then lady at the back, please. And then that, I'm sorry, that will be it. <coughs> sorry. We've talked a lot about, um, we've, we've talked a lot about the impact in a very sort of national way, but of course every election is actually you know, 650 local ones. So it's how, how much dissonance is there between sort of the, the national view and, or how people think nationally about a party and how people think 
locally about their MP and how they're going to vote in, in the election. And in a world, in a more multi-party multi world where the classic swingometer doesn't seem to work in the same way is, is how sort of sustainable is the current model, I guess. Lady there? Yes, with the hand up. Thank you. Uh, Astrid Hamper, student at King's and also an intern at the European Commission, which is why I must ask um, what role you think the EU and the whole debate um, on the referendum will play in this election? Because I have the feeling that in the British press, the topic is much more represented than in other countries. But the average British citizen, how much does he actually understand about all the nuances of the different referendum offers, and if he does understand them, does he actually care? Okay. Two good questions, right. Margaret first. Okay. Gosh, they are very difficult. Um, uh, I think uh, incumbency uh, matters, uh, and particularly it matters for the Lib Liberal Democrats. Uh, I think they will do much better locally than their national poll rating. So in some cases where you can really build in not all politicians are good at that. I think they're particularly good as a political party and as a, in, individuals. Um, the second question about Europe, yeah, wow. Given how important it is going to be post-election, this issue, um, I don't think it will have the uh, prominence in the election that it should. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how business and the city are standing back on this. Uh, but absolutely... It is really, 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 the, the frame of the debate is going to change dramatically uh, according to who is elected. John? Um, well, uh, I just briefly say that um, I'm, I'm skeptical of people saying that uh, the sort of old swing model doesn't work anymore. I think as long as, as long as you count Scotland separately and assume that the SNP is going to win nearly all the seats in Scotland, uh, then the normal swing model will work perfectly well in, uh, in England because it'll, it'll cancel out. Um, obviously, the Lib Dems will hold more seats than, uh, than the votes would suggest, but uh, I think, I think the, the standard model still works as long as you treat Scotland separately. And as for, as for Europe, I sort of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Dan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree, I agree with John on the, on the, the, the point about the, the sort of the standard model. I mean, I think actually we'll wake up after this election and, and, and all these predictions of this sort of new political world, will, I, I'm not entirely sure they'll come to pass. On the EU referendum issue, I mean, it's not something that a, a vast majority of the British um, electorate will engage with. To the extent that it does have an, a political influence, it will benefit the Tories because David Cameron's pledge of a referendum will be one of the factors that will, will have an influence in, in, in squeezing the UKIP vote and ensuring that a small but nonetheless important section of that UKIP vote will return to the, return to the Tories, in my view. And Martin? Uh, well, just, just on the local point, and it's, a, it's a, sli a slightly different point, but I think an important point when thinking about the media. We haven't talked at all about the local media and the local press, and one of the um, uh, particular things that's happened in the last five years is the decline of the local press in terms of the number of newspapers and the number of reporters at a local level. Uh, and what we're seeing, sadly, is, 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 is much less reporting from the ground um, and therefore less reporting, uh, partly less reporting of the incumbents, but particularly less reporting of the candidates. And to come back to the point about social media, um, uh, I think necessarily uh, many candidates are going to have to use social media very intelligently. Um, because otherwise they really won't have a voice, either because there is no local paper or because the local paper um, uh, uh, only you know, has, has very, very limited space and very limited reporting resources. Um, so I think um, we are seeing a transformation in that respect, certainly at a local level. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, so just quickly then, uh, just on, on Euro Europe um, and the referendum, the, interesting the work that we're doing with unbound philanthropy, trying to, trying to look at uh, how attitudes are shifting during the campaign around immigration. One of the things that we're trying to test is the extent to which immigration and Europe have managed to be melded together in people's minds as two wedge issues, which has clearly been um, the, the object of, of some of the parties. And, it, and there's no evidence of that at all. There is there's very, very little interest in Europe among the public. There's uh, stuff that we've released recently um, that shows that it's, 
in terms of election priorities, it comes very low down people's lists. People think it's going to make up more of the election campaign than they would, they would like to, but not much more, not, not as much as immigration. So th those two issues have not been melded together in people's minds in the way that, so that some people may have been aiming to do. And then uh, finally on the, um, the local variation, um, I'm, I'm, it's really good to hear that Dan and John are confident. We're not at all confident <laughs> about uh, the swingometer and, and uniform swing working. We're quite terrified about how we're going to predict uh, the final election and its uh, um, kind of election results. And it, it's one of the reasons you're seeing much more constituency polling in this election, and you're going mm -hmm. to continue to see that. Um, one thing I would say is obviously we also run the exit poll, which is um, not constituency based, but it's, it's very locally based, taking lots and lots of different polling stations. And, and, and in that type of model, that's actually something that we can have a lot of confidence. Not putting too much pressure on colleagues here who are running it, but the exit <laughs> poll should still reflect. But probably all the, all the constituency polling just reflects the national polling. Um, True. If you, if if you, you treat Scotland, Scotland differently. Yes, no, I agree. Um, agree. So, so, you know, Dan and I are going to be proved right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really do, John. I really do. Great. Can I um, thank everybody for coming? Uh, we must finish now, uh, but we will adjourn upstairs to the first floor to the chapter's room for drinks and canapes. I'm not sure quite who has sponsored the drinks and canapes. Could be the but Daily Telegraph. I think <laughs> not. <laughs> but it could equally well be Ipsos Mori. Can I thank everybody and particularly thank our panel for a very good discussion? Thank you.